Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Ben Cifuentes Jauregui. I'm Vice Chancellor for Undergraduate Academic Affairs. And it's really a pleasure to welcome you to today's event, part of the uh, speaker series, the UAA speaker series. Uh, one a major uh, element of these series is to bring to campus um, public intellectuals to debate issues that are important to all of us. And today's guest, uh, John Villaseñor, uh, has really uh, launched such debates and such conversations. Uh, last, um, uh, last September, uh, he published a position paper in the Brookings Institute website uh, speaking about uh, college students and First Amendment uh, issues. So uh, we're very happy to have him with us. Uh, Professor Villaseñor is uh, the non-resident senior fellow in governance studies uh, and the Center for Technology Innovation at the Brookings Institute. He's also professor of electrical engineering, public policy, and management. He's a visiting professor of law at UCLA. His work addresses the intersection of technology, policy, and law. Professor Villaseñor has written many articles for The Atlantic, The Chronicle of Higher Education, Forbes, The Los Angeles Times, Scientific American, not to mention many academic journals. Before joining UCLA, uh, Dr. Villaseñor was with the NASA Jet Propulsion Laboratory, where he developed methodologies of imaging, um, methodologies of imaging the Earth from space. Dr. Villaseñor is going to present his research on college student views of the First Amendment and the findings of some of our uh, some of other recent surveys. After his presentation. Uh, I will moderate a panel that will include our speaker, along with Professor William Field from the Political Science Department, and two undergraduate students uh, who were peer instructors for FIGS, Elise uh, Zhao and April Nicklaus. So welcome, uh, Professor Villaseñor. So th thank you, everybody, for uh, coming here. Um, I just want to say I know that you're all really busy, and so I will try to be uh, efficient and, and uh, uh, make, make sure we get on to what I'm sure is going to be the um, far, by far more interesting part of this program, which is hearing uh, from the panelists and, and particularly uh, our, our students and your own faculty members here. So what I'm going to do for uh, no more than about 15 minutes is, is give a, an overview of some of the recent survey results, including from mine, which, which can help kind of set the stage to talk about this really important uh, issue of freedom of expression on campuses. And to start, I'm going to just ask for a little audience participation here. The First Amendment confers or addresses five freedoms. Can people tell me what those five are? That's not fair. The professor doesn't get the answer. Yes. Now, speech is one of them. Assembly. Religion. Petition the government for grievances. Press. Press. Perfect. Terrific. So those are the, the five freedoms that we have under the First Amendment. Um, and uh, you got all the answers. There they are in slightly different order, but there they are. And then the text of the First Amendment, of course, no, no need to go through that, but that's what it says. Um, so the First Amendment is, of course, not limitless. There are limits. Um, and so there's, there's some well-established exceptions to the First Amendment that are established through some key uh, Supreme Court cases. So any examples anyone can think of of, of speech that's outside? Yes, sir? Inciting yeah, so it, incitements to imminent lawless action uh, that, are, you know, that are likely to create action under uh, a very important case in the 1960s. That's right. Anything else? Examples? Yeah. Right. Well, yeah. Liz, yeah. There's, there's, there's. Uh, there are exceptions li like that. That's a. That's one. Any, anything else? How about threats? You allowed to threaten people? There's an exception called true threats, which are threats, you know, which are, you know, really likely to make the person, you know, made with the intent of making this person believe that there's, uh, um, uh, imminent, you know, harm to come to them. How about? Um, Am I, if, am I allowed to, let, let's say uh, our, our, our vice chancellor here thinks I'm a bank, wants to go on social media and say John is a bank robber. Is that protected speech? 
I'm not, by the way, a bank robber. <laughs> but assuming I'm not a bank robber, what, 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 is, what is it called when someone says something or publishes something that's false? Yeah. Libel. It's, libel or, it's libel or slander. So libel is if it's written, slander if it's spoken, but collectively it's defamation. Okay, so defamation is also outside the scope. So I, I can't go on social media and say the vice chancellor is a bank robber, um, in, unless he really is, which of course he isn't, uh, because that would be defamatory. So, and I can't use the First Amendment as a grounds to say that I have the right to, to, to say that. So these are some examples. Oh, another example is time, place, and manner restrictions. Some of those are very uncontroversial. So for example, if you want to turn your, your stereo speakers, put them on your window, and crank up music really loudly at 3 in the morning, as loud as you can, well, clearly the, the state, the government, can stop you from doing that. And that's because, um, because you know, there are restrictions. Noise restrictions like that are, are not, you don't have a free speech right to blast loud music into the neighborhood at 3 in the morning. So there's, there's, restrictions, there's restrictions like that. So with that as context, I'm going to go into a, a couple of, of, of results from surveys. And it's interesting, the, the last um, six months or so, there's been a bunch of surveys published. I'm not going to read everything on these slides. I did a survey of 1,500 undergraduates. Coincidentally, that survey was conducted in August of 2017, immediately after, in the weeks after uh, those horrifying events in Charlottesville, Virginia. So that certainly may have been on the minds of people when they took the survey. Uh, a group called McLaughlin Associates surveyed 800, I surveyed 1,500 undergraduates. McLaughlin surveyed 800 undergraduates. The Economist and, and YouGov did a, a, a survey uh, of that I'm going to cite, even though it's not student specific. Um, and then there's two more that I wanted to brief, briefly mention here. Um, FIRE, the Foundation for Individual Rights in Education, did a survey of 1,250 undergraduates. And then the Cato Institute published a survey of people generally. I'm going to re briefly run through a couple of, of, of the results from a lot of these surveys. I'll focus a little more on mine, because that's the one I know most. So here, here's, and I'm not going to go through all the numbers here. This is one of the things I asked. I said, a public university invites a very controversial speaker to an on-campus event. The speaker is known for making offensive and hurtful statements. A student group opposed to the speaker uses violence to prevent the speaker from speaking. Do you agree or disagree that the, student's action, the group's actions are acceptable? So I'm going to focus only on the left for now, just in the interest of time. So 19% of the respondents stated that they thought that those actions were acceptable. And th this was a result that, when I published it, occasioned quite a bit of surprise and criticism and doubt. But one thing that's interesting is the economist then asked exactly the same question, because they saw that and they said, well, hey, why don't we ask that as well? So within a few weeks, they asked the same question. And within the 18 to 29 age group, they got 14% agreeing. Remember, I got 19%. But then they, they had a not sure category, and I didn't have a not sure category. So if you take the not sures and you apportion them between agree and disagree, you get around 17% on the agree, which is not too different from um, what I got. So these are people in the 18 to 29 age group in that survey. Not necessarily students, but certainly a similar demographic uh, in, in many ways. Um, from the McLaughlin survey, uh, again, I'm just going to focus on the left. Uh, agree or disagree with the statement, words can be a form of violence. So uh, they had 81% uh, uh, saying that they agreed that words can be a form of violence. So it's, it, it ties uh, to, you know, to this question of the inner, uh, inner relationship between violence and speech. Another McLaughlin result. Question, asked to agree or disagree with this statement. If someone is using hate speech or making racially charged comments, physical violence can be justified to prevent this person from espousing their hateful views. You have almost a third, 30% of the respondents agreeing uh, with, with that statement. Okay. So moving on, um, this is, you know, what's interesting is FIRE had a, had a, 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 you know, a related question. They talk about a you know, guest speaker who you strongly disagree with. And the question is, would you, the person taking the survey, use violent or disruptive actions to prevent the event from occurring? And they only had 1%. So what's interesting is that when you ask people whether they themselves would you know, engage in violence to pretend, prevent a speaker, then you get a, a very low number. But when you ask people in a more general sense whether they would endorse or agree with that idea of using violence to stop speech, the numbers are certainly uh, very different. So it's an interesting kind of uh, counterpoint there. Um, another uh, question, does the First Amendment protect hate speech? Uh, in my survey, 39% uh, of people said yes. And combined 54, 50, uh, I, guess, I, guess, I guess about a combined 60% uh, of people um, said they either didn't know or that it should not protect hate speech. Fire asked the same question on the left here. Uh, and you get be between the, the, the green and the sort of 
purple or whatever that is, 54% of people saying either no or I don't know in the answer to, in, in the answer to that question. Um, uh, I, here's incitement, as we just talked about, incitements to imminent lawless action are not protected. So I created a scenario where I said a protest leader addressing a, a crowd of angry protesters tells protesters they should send a message by smashing the windows of nearby storefronts. Should the protest leader's statements be protected by the First Amendment? And the answer, the, the right answer to this is no, because that's clearly an incitement to an imminent lawless action, yet 24% of, of the respondents thought that the First Amendment should protect that statement. And then uh, another, this is on defamation. So the scenario is a man goes to a restaurant, the restaurant owner is rude, the man's angry, so he posts a review on Yelp falsely saying he got food poisoning from eating at the restaurant. Should, you know, to what extent do you agree you know, th th that the man's posting of the Yelp review should be protected by the First Amendment? This is not protected speech because it's clearly defamation. It's not true. He didn't actually or she didn't actually get um, food poisoning. But, um, uh, but he said that. And so 44% of people gave, in some sense, in this sense, some of these questions, there's, there's no, quote, formal right or wrong answer. But this, there is a right or wrong answer. And 44% of the people here wrongly said that this, this should be, or believed it should be protected. Uh, well, I guess, I guess it's an opinion, so they, write, they have a right to think it should be protected. But certainly, it is not protected uh, under current frameworks. Um, I'm not going to read everything on this slide. But one really interesting question is whether Online speech should be protected less than, the same as, or more than uh, regular kind of person-to-person -person speech. And so I asked, you know, wh which of those it should be. And the answer was that most people thought, if you look in the 76%, most people thought online speech should be given the same level of protection. A small percentage thought it should be given less, and a higher percentage thought it should be given more. Uh, and then. Uh, What's interesting is that even though there's pretty substantial disconnect between a lot of the, the understanding of the First Amendment on, among many respondents and the actual First Amendment scope, nearly everyone agrees that with the statement in today's society, the First Amendment is a relevant, important part of, of American democracy. So the, I, the concept of the First Amendment is strongly endorsed by a, certainly a larger percentage of people than uh, would necessarily uh, know uh, the full contours of, of the First Amendment, which is an interesting, interesting result. And the final thing, the final thing I'll, I'll close with here is this is from a Cato survey, not of students, just a, a, a survey. And the reason I pre present this is because it's often suggested that people on the political left on campuses are, are intolerant uh, to uh, freedom of expression. But this is an example that shows intolerance to a higher degree from the political right. Um, so what this is, is a, the question Cato asked was, would you favor uh, a stripping a person of their US citizenship if they burn the American flag? Now let me pause for a moment in saying that burning an American flag, while certainly offensive to many people, is constitutionally protected. In fact, there was a specific court case called Texas v. Johnson in 1989 on that exact question. And the Supreme Court said that, uh, that state laws that criminalize burning of a flag are unconstitutional because they violate the Fourth Amendment. And so in here you see that uh, yet despite that ruling, 40% of the respondents or 39% are saying uh, that citizenship should be stripped. And there's a, a, a much no larger number of, of Republicans who, who said that as opposed to Democrats. And again, I present this because I, I think it's very important to emphasize to, 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 to understand that this is an issue, intolerance in my view at least, uh, to uh, to uh, certain to, to freedom of expression can come and does come from both ends of the, of, of the political spectrum. Uh, so there's many more things that could be said about this, but I would rather have our students and your professors say them. So I'm going to, having presented some of this data, I'm going to step off and we will get to the next portion of our program, I think, so. Thank you, so I'd like to now welcome uh, Professor Field, uh, Elise Sal, and uh, April Nicholas to join us on stage. I'm going to ask each one of uh, ask each one of our guest speakers um, um, 
Elise, uh, April, and Professor Field, if they could just introduce themselves briefly for the audience. Um, sure. So my name is April Nicklaus. Uh, I'm a, a junior here at Rutgers in the School of Environmental and Biological Sciences, uh, majoring in Environmental Policy, Institutions, and Behavior. Um, hi, my name is Elise. I'm a senior. Should I like lean in for this? Or? Yeah. <laughs> Pull it back? Okay. <laughs> Okay, um, I'm a senior in SAS, majoring in political science and philosophy, minoring in history. I'm William Field, undergraduate program director in political science. Uh, I teach political science here. Great. So I, I, I'm now going to uh, ask a couple of very stock questions, and then we're going to open this up for the rest of the audience to participate in a dialogue, which I think is what Professor uh, Villaseñor and all of us here would like to to engage in. Uh, so uh, asking uh, our students and Professor Field, uh, if you could comment, uh, what did you find interesting? What struck you of the research that you read or that Professor uh, Villaseñor uh, has presented? And uh, could you perhaps tell us if you think, especially the students, if you think this matches what you've seen among Rutgers students? Obviously, you haven't done a kind of survey, but <laughs> you're just your general impressions. I think sure. it would be helpful. Sure. Um, I guess I, go for it. I'm sitting next to you, so I guess I'll start. Um, so I think uh, you know what I found um, especially interesting about. Um, I still don't know if I'm. Is this is this okay? Uh, uh, is this okay now? Okay, great, great. Um, so I think what I found especially interesting, uh, not so much from, from the presentation we've seen here, but, but when I was reading through this uh, study earlier, is um, uh, the type of terminology that was, uh, that was used in the study, I think, is um, uh, given the very, um, uh, given the way that, that society now, especially politically, is uh, sort of separated into our own groups and in how we think and how we perceive language. I think that the terminology that was used in a lot of the study questions is uh, open to very different interpretation by people who sort of live in these different media subcultures. Um, and so I think one of the things that I found very interesting, you know, especially when looking at the breakdown between Republican versus Democrat versus independents and how they viewed um, the questions and their responses uh, to the questions is, um, you know, terms like, uh, like hate speech and even things like um, you know, bias, uh, you know, that, that's, uh, that's something that uh, different uh, folks um, who consume different media would probably have very different uh, views on. Um, yeah, I think that for me, this is also from the article that was published on Brookings. Um, I think the results, comparing results where the political alignments of the students was different was kind of interesting to me because I think there were some questions where there was a divide among Democrats and Republicans primarily, and then there were other questions where the divide was like the same proportion between Democrats and Republicans. So like, I think to me that indicates that, like sort of like what you were saying at the end, the professor mentioned this, um, how political alignments are sort of associated with free speech issues. And it's, it to a certain extent, I think, transcends political divides and is something like there are some questions that the proportion of people who answered yes or no or agree or disagree was like comparably similar among both um, sides of the political spectrum. And I think that for the Rutgers question, um, I think especially in political science and like, you know, being in classes like civil liberties and con law and things that like talk more directly about free speech, there definitely are students, and I think I was one of them, who went into the class not knowing very much about free speech and making a lot of assumptions about it. Um, I think especially with social media now, it's like really easy to make assumptions about what is or isn't protected on, on the internet. Um, so I think it's definitely, like your results, your findings definitely are reflected to some degree in at Rutgers. Okay. A couple of very minor points to start off and then something a bit bigger after that. First thing is that when you're burning a flag, it's actually the appropriate way to dispose of a damaged flag. So this idea of burning a flag is actually what the Boy Scouts do quite regularly, and it's perfectly legal. So there's a little bit of, of confusion about as flag pro, burning as, protest. as such, as protest. Nevertheless, as protest, you're absolutely right. Second of all, the First Amendment starts with the following five words, Congress shall make no law. It doesn't say that I can't make a policy in my classroom or somebody else can make a policy. So there is some confusion between where you do and don't have access to free speech. You did suggest at a public university, we are state uh, created, 
therefore we fall under more constitutional protections than a private school does, but still it creates a space where it's not clear who actually gets to make the rules. So there is some room for uh, nuance there also. But to move into uh, some more details, uh, one thing that struck me is I think you're suggesting that this is a, a new problem, that our students are somehow, oh, no. No. oh good, because no, our students somehow don't get it. I just wanna pull up some 1964 data. This is from the 1964 National Election Study, where we found, for example, on the question uh, asked to uh, the people responding to that survey, there are times when it almost seems better for people to take the law into their own hands rather than wait for the machinery of government to act. 27% of the people said, yes, I agree, and that's nationwide, not just students. 42% of people said, I don't mind a politician's methods if he manages to get things right, to get the right things done. Uh, and 35% said, uh, agreed that the true American way of life is disappearing so fast that we may have to use force to save it. I'm suggesting here that this, that this lack of tolerance, whether it's for speech or anything else, is pretty much a, a permanent fixture in the American political system. We don't understand the First Amendment as people. Our, our, our leaders might better, but we certainly do not. Do you want to respond or? Okay. I, I guess the one thing I'd add is, is, is just, I think m many people might know this, but in, in light of those very help, helpful comments, of course, the First Amendment constrains government. It doesn't constrain private actors. So uh, a private company, for example, is certainly free to tell, you know, to have policies about what its employees can and can't say, uh, you know, in, in, you know in, when, in the context of their work for, for the company. But uh, uh, the government, which includes not only the federal government, the state, the state governments, municipal governments are constrained by the First Amendment. So New Jersey could not make it, you know, unlawful to criticize any sports team in New Jersey. Um, uh, that would clearly well, it may be tempting. <laughs> <laughs> that would be not 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 constitutional. And that sorry, uh, and that puts Facebook and uh, those kinds of social media spaces into a very strange position because they are private companies. And what obligation, what role do they have both to protect and right. to limit speech? It's an incredibly important question. Uh, and, and actually, last year we spent a, a lot of time looking at um, uh, new technologies and, and protected speech. And that became a very big issue because we really don't have policies to address issues like uh, recording uh, of, 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 and using of new social technologies, but I, I wanted to come back later. Uh, the other thing I wanted to also clear up is uh, there's oftentimes to be a conflation between academic speech and free speech. And academic speech is something that uh, a lot of people think it's like you can say anything you want because you and you won't lose your job. And it, that's really what it is. It's not. It's basically um, the university pays me, so there, the, the, I do have some kind of constraint even in the, in the kind of speech that I may deliver or not. But uh, moving forward, uh, one of the things that we, we clearly see from from many of the comments. Uh, today is that uh, free speech protections of, of the First Amendment are complex and individual freedoms vary according to the intent of the speech and the context in which the speech takes place. So, and, and, and you pointed out to, to this very uh, thing about uh, uh, intent and context. Um, the interpretation of the First Amendment has changed over time for issues such as the rights of citizens to protest, um, involvement in uh, foreign wars, flag burning, and the publication of classified government documents. How do you think new technologies and ways of thinking will continue to alter that interpretation? And in any of you can take this question. <laughs> We have to stand by the first five words, Congress shall make no law. Um, it's very, very hard for the government to impose a law which really controls how social media gets used, how email gets used. Um, that said, it's often said, you may have heard this, uh, sticks and stones may break my bones. Have you heard that term before? What's the next part of that quote? JDF, what's the next part of that quote? But words will never hurt me. Well, I have a comment reaction for that. It starts with a B, ends with a T, and I can't say that in, in public. But you know what I'm talking about. You know, that is garbage. Words do hurt. Words on social media, 
words delivered in email, words really do hurt. And if we're going to be raising people to participate fully in community, we have to be aware that words hurt. Now, how we control those words raises a whole spectrum of, of problems, but that's what we're talking about, yeah. I think. You're talking about Mary Matsuda and uh, Richard Delgado's work at Words That Wound. Yep, that could be. I'm not familiar with those, but yes. Yeah. There, there's a, a large study in critical race theory that basically uses that particular kind of uh, idea, words that wound, that metaphor, to talk about language, mm -hmm. especially using hate, sp and, and it goes to the very question of hate speech. Uh, so uh, hate speech is, an, is no longer just speech that uh, identifies or defines something, but it's used deliberately as a way of, of performing a particular injury on another body. So uh, there, there, there is, within critical race theory, a huge uh, scholarship uh, that began really in the late 90s uh, that, 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 that talks and, and thinks through those mm -hmm. questions. Uh, so l talking about words that wound, uh, I, 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 and, and thinking about the context of the college setting, I, I, I want us to talk about microaggressions. Um, uh, American psychiatrist uh, Alvin Poussin, uh, known for his research on the effects of racism in the black community, refers to the cumulative impact of experiencing microaggressions as death by a thousand nicks. Um, uh, others, um, so, so can we can we sort of um, I get everybody's uh, response to this idea of words that wound or death by a thousand nicks, if you like? Uh, what is our responsibility uh, to the, that particular kind of uh, speech, uh, which is microaggressions, which is oftentimes hard to to identify, especially because it's in oftentimes dismissed as simply. Uh, the person who's being injured is uh, dismissed as being over, overly sensitive or uh, they just need to get over it and so forth. Mm -hmm. So, Yeah, I think that's a very interesting question. I think that, um, you know, what, what you mentioned about uh, how, how it's often um, regarded with uh, dismissal is a very important part in, in how we view microaggressions. Um, you know, if, if you were a third party witness to blatant discrimination, you know, just outright, uh, I guess we're, you know, throwing around the term hate speech, then outright hate speech, then probably the reaction that most of us would have is to say something about it and to view that as a, a serious issue. Um, but most of us, I would uh, tend to think, would either not identify, not notice, or not feel right in, uh, in calling out a microaggression that we witnessed, uh, you know, as a third party. Um, and I think that uh, you know the idea of uh, a death by a thousand uh, nicks is um, is exactly right. You know, if, if you are part of a marginalized group and you are facing microaggressions at every turn throughout uh, your entire life, then um, you know to a certain extent you uh, there's the risk of internalizing some of those sentiments as well, which can be harmful in the long run for every individual. Um, yeah, I think microaggressions for me are difficult in two different senses. One, based on the person who's sort of like the aggressor, and on the other, the person who's on the receiving end, because I think microaggressions are tough since the person who's supposedly the aggressor might not even know that they're doing something wrong. They might not intend to really um, harm anything, and maybe even if they knew that they were harming someone, they wouldn't do it, and they would actively try to prevent themselves from doing it. And so in those types of situations, I kind of like it kind of worries me whether or not we should be blaming those people or treating those people the same way that we want to treat people who are like blatantly racist or people who intentionally harm others. And on the other end of the spectrum, I think, like if we look at the people who are on the receiving end, microaggressions by nature of being microaggressions, I think it's really easy to buy into the narrative and to either for practical reasons or because it's just something that you're around all the time and are unconsciously you know, getting used to. I think there are some situations where, like let's say like as a woman, I might not find something to be offensive, but another woman might. And so is, should that be categorized as a microaggression? Should that, like how should we deal with that whenever there isn't necessarily a consensus on either end? Um, but I think those are sort of like the gray areas that are really difficult to deal with. But I think for at least the cases where we know for sure that there was something that was said that was offensive, um, I think definitely we shouldn't just be like sitting back and letting it go because that's 
how they were sort of formed in the first place, right? Like no one brought it up and mm -hmm. they just unintentionally said it and it just became part of the rhetoric. Um, so yeah, I think yeah. definitely it applies. It, one, one point to um, what Elise just mentioned, I think that um, uh, sort of the distinction that, that she was making is, uh, is the, the education element. So in terms of uh, you know, blatant discrimination, we treat that differently because we all generally know um, that those types of behaviors are wrong or not socially acceptable. And because that is sort of part of the, uh, the, the public um, body of knowledge and we expect that the person perpetrating those behaviors is also aware that that is not generally socially acceptable, then we infer that their intention specifically is to harm. Um, whereas those who are, are perpetrators of microaggressions, um, because there is not so much a, a body of education on that issue and because it's not as easy to identify, um, we don't know how to react uh, because we don't know what that person's intentions were. And, uh, and the intentions, you know, matter uh, just as much as, as the actual uh, actions matter. Um, so I think that, uh, you know, one of the elements of, of this issue is, is the approach to uh, identifying and, uh, and, um, and assessing the issue of microaggressions is the approach to censor or is the approach to educate. I really dislike the word microaggression uh, and the concept behind it. I find it repugnant. However, <laughs> in my capacity as, a, as on the faculty here and running the undergraduate program, I have myself driven students from the classroom on one occasion that I can remember because of my reaction to what he said. He gave a re a, an answer to a question that I raised that was completely off the wall. And I knew that he'd just come back to class having been away for a period of months because of a mental health situation. And I gave a reaction that I thought was accepting and tolerant, but I never saw the student again. And microaggressions, whatever they actually are, are real. Um, the question kind of comes back to what can we do about it legislatively? And I'm afraid I get hung up on these five words, Congress shall make no law. Uh, what can the university do? What can the state do? What can the federal government do to, to, to legislate to solve these speech problems? And the answer, generally speaking, is almost nothing. This is where we get to the question of uh, politically correct speech versus speech that we are trying to adopt to be inclusive and tolerant. PC is a dirty word. It's meant to denigrate the concept of micro uh, aggression, but the reality is that we have an obligation to our fellow creatures to be as careful and as inclusive as we can be. I guess I would just add that um, uh, I, I think I'm concurring in the sense that I think from a the First Amendment is is broad enough that, for example, you know, a state or the federal government, or for that matter, a state university would have a hard time, you know, in enacting, you know censorship essentially regarding microaggressions, but I, I still think there's a, that there are other things that can be done outside of laws, and one is one that's just raising awareness. I, I think that probably everyone in this room, uh, certainly me included, have at one point in their lives said something which might have been viewed by somebody else as, as a microaggression. I, I doubt whether there's anyone in this room who would raise their hand and say, I have never in my entire life said anything that could ever be categorized like that, and I expect that most or all of us in this room have been the recipient of statements that we found to be far more insulting or hurtful than perhaps the speaker intended. So I think the the solution to the extent there is one, and hopefully this isn't over light, overly naive, naive, is just, you know, all of us have a higher burden, I think, of kind of thinking proactively about how what we say might be impacted, uh, might impact other people. And when we, as we inevitably do, say something which we, which we then immediately realize has been more hurtful than we intended, that we, we at least uh, acknowledge that and try to think more carefully next time. So I, I think the solution to these sorts of things is not legislative, but social. Uh, at least that's my, my opinion. I, I, I guess I just want to add, uh, following something April said, that, that the idea of microaggression is actually a, a, a kind of injurious speech, but it's the force with which uh, we uh, articulate it. In other words, you, you made the distinction between overt racism or overt um, hate speech versus a microaggression. And might it not be better if we just called it an aggression? Because what ends up happening is a microaggression is something that's recognized by a community that up to that moment had not called it an aggression before. 
So uh, it is returning to, say, women or queers or people of color, the possibility to name an aggression against them and to call it micro. It just sort of as a way of making it palatable for the person who actually is saying it, but because they are now having access to a voice to identify it as an aggression. So, I, I mean, I'm just throwing this out as, a, 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 as something for us to consider that rather than by calling it a microaggression, we're not being very uh, helpful to recognizing all the kinds of aggressions that come our way. But um, that may be something for us to leave as a question and, and, and discuss, or unless somebody wants to react to that uh, vision or that perspective. Okay, next question. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> I told you I had very stock questions, but I'm very excited to hear from the audience. Uh, I'll try to finish very quickly. Uh, so one, one issue that uh, has come up around colleges and universities uh, is the role, and I think, uh, John, uh, in, your, in your work is what role does the university have to protect students, whether, that, whether it is really a university's role uh, to do this. So I'm thinking about uh, the work that, um, the statements of Dean of Students at the University of Chicago, uh, John Ellison, who wrote to new students in a very famous email uh, I, and I, I mean, I'm quoting, our commitment to academic freedom means that we do not support so-called trigger warnings. We do not cancel invited speakers because their topics might prove controversial, and we do not condone the creation of intellectual safe spaces where students can retreat from ideas and perspectives at odds with their own, end of quote. To some, this message was much needed campaign against political correctness. To others, the letter distorted programs on which many students rely. It ignored the hostility students feel on campus and belittled the sincerity of those who work to make higher education more inclusive. Still others believe that the letter limited academic freedom by discouraging the use of those practices, meaning the trigger warnings. So maybe I could get some reactions into the idea of trigger warnings and where do the students and the faculty uh, um, stand in relationship to, to this practice? Who do you want to answer first? It doesn't matter. <laughs> you started speaking. Why don't you go ahead? <laughs> um, I'm going to have to fall into the latter category on that one. That is, um, uh, it's a continuation of the notion that careful speech is, quote, politically correct and therefore wrong. Um, the whole PC idea was raised to denigrate the notion that, that we need to be careful uh, about how we present information. Um, I have had, I have seen students who have either come to me or who have had left my class because something's been said in class which hits too close to where they were yesterday. For instance, a family member just died or somebody else is going on and something comes up in class and that student gets knocked sideways by whatever the conversation is. Um, yes, we are students and faculty, we are people, but we're also, we're, we're strong and we're fragile and we just need to be aware of each other as we're communicating uh, and not simply broadcast our perspective, whatever the impact might possibly be. Um, yeah, I, I think that it's hard to, to draw a, like a strict line that, you know, all universities should follow or that all professors should follow. I think it's hard to make a generalization like that because safe spaces and trigger warnings, to me at least, are something that came about because the issues that we're talking about in classes and the conversations that we're having on campus are deeply personal and the impact of it is really subjective and based on the individual experience of whoever's listening and whoever is speaking. So on the one hand, I, I do think that like, a university is a place where hopefully students come to learn more and to be challenged and to be, to a certain extent, uncomfortable with the views that they came in with. Like countless political science classes that I've been in, they all, like professors love doing the survey where they're like, what were your political views in high school? And what are they now? And like, how have you changed? And I think that that's something that's really valuable. And I think those conversations shouldn't be, um, you know, hindered or, or 
prevented in any way, but also I think it's important to like value students and insofar as professors are okay with it and the university is okay with it, I think that things like trigger warnings could be useful for facilitating productive discussions. Yeah, I think that um, this really, uh, you know, a, a close tie-in to, to the concept of safe spaces and trigger warnings and um, a lot of the other things that, uh, that are so often uh, attacked as, as being, you know, politically correct. Um, one of the terms that is sort of thrown out there to, to combat these ideas is the idea of, of, of censorship, you know, and specifically self-censorship. Um, and I think that, uh, you know, the, the tie-in here um, really is that uh, motive plays a, a big role in things, uh, and then also the, the underlying factors of uh, what the individuals are feeling and why it is that they do what they do. Um, and so trigger warnings, you know, the, the intention is not to prevent people from conveying the things that they sincerely are feeling, but to uh, stop and be aware of how what they're saying or doing could be uh, affecting other people who are in that same space as they are. Um, and so I think, you know, generally speaking, um, if someone is censoring what they are saying uh, because they um, are just socially aware and they are uh, fearful of hurting someone else, then I think that uh, that generally is, is a good thing. Um, if someone is censoring what they're saying because they are fearful that someone else uh, will hurt them or, or you know, react neg negatively towards them in some way and that they're fearful for themselves, then that's generally not a good thing. Um, so I think that there's a, a big misconception about trigger warnings and what the intention is and also um, sort of who they're there to protect. I'll just chime in and say that um, I do believe that um, it's important not to make the key metric on conversations that are permissible the question of whether somebody else might be offended. Um, because I think if, if we are prevented from ever uttering thoughts or taking positions that other people might find offensive, then we really shut down a lot of really important, legitimate debate on which reasonable people can have different opinions. And you can think of any number of incredibly important current issues on which reasonable people can have different opinions, and some people may find it offensive to hear uh, opinions of other generally reasonable people who just happen to disagree on that particular point. So I, I do worry sometimes that on campuses the, 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 um, the criteria that gets evaluated is, does this offend me? And if the answer is yes, then the next step is, well, then it shouldn't be said. And I think sometimes that can lead to a narrowing of, of the dialogue that I think colleges are supposed to provide. I have to wonder how much of that really is going on. We certainly hear about it in the news. We hear about, uh, ooh, what's the college in Washington where they're actually boycotting? The, Evergreen. Uh, no, not, not Evergreen. Not um, it, it starts with a W, I think. Uh, they're they're no? boycotting the intro class, required class for everybody because it is too Western oh. and too white and something else. No, that's, no, the Evergreen was a different one. Yeah, You're okay, right. You're totally this right. Is, I forget the name of the school. It's one of the most progressive schools in the country, and it's a very, very inclusive required course, and people are for the last year and a half, sitting and boycotting it. You know, that's happening. That, that is happening here and there. But in the, most of the students in the room right now are in my class, religion and politics. And how many of you have not been offended by me in the last uh, eight weeks or so <laughs> of class? Not been offended? I think, well, six of you raised your hands. <laughs> Uh, seven of you raised your hands. Um, I warned you on the first day that, you know, I'm going to be offending. If I haven't yet, I will. Um, and we've been tearing apart most of the religious traditions that we're looking at. We, we will be tearing apart other things here and there. Um, that is the nature of uh, academic inquiry. Um, that said, there is an area where the inquiry gets personal and gets personally offensive and painful. And the line is very gray, but the line is there. And where you are or I am or the student over there is on that side of that line will vary by circumstance and by student, but there is a line. So uh, I have one final question, and, and John, this goes back to your paper. Uh, regarding where do we go from here. Uh, 
um, there seemed to be a suggestion that students really did not appreciate or understand the complexity of the First Amendment and you say maybe there should be some kind of civics course for high school students or earlier, where do we start? Uh, I always like telling the anecdote of uh, teaching my American Sexualities class, which is a, a great big class, and when we discuss Roe versus Wade, and uh, we start with Griswold in Connecticut and follow the whole trajectory, and then we go into um, um, Lawrence v. Texas, uh, I say that these cases are not about abortion or about uh, sodomy laws, but they're really about privacy. And students get very struck by the fact that uh, we had to use uh, this issue, this whole thing was constructed in order to resolve very personal bodily issues. So um, the same thing is true with the First Amendment. Oftentimes a lot of the issues are not, so not they're not readily knowable. There's the penumbra of, uh, uh, of the issue, uh, uh, the penumbra of the legal case. Uh, so, and, and making that visible or making that available to students is oftentimes very complex and, 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 and to the public in general uh, is, is a very complex thing. So maybe uh, if you could reflect, and I'll ask this of the faculty, uh, and, and, and the students might think as well, uh, re respond to them, uh, where, do we, where do we begin educating uh, folks on these matters related to uh, our Bill of Rights? Yeah, well, I'll briefly say, I don't think we should be turning our high school students into experts on constitutional law. That's, oh, no. that's a, a high <laughs> bar. But I also think we could probably do a better job, both uh, in high school and, and in college, of, of, of just raising awareness on these things. And again, I'm not talking about massive curricular changes, just, just some basic things. I think to the extent that there's a lack of, of knowledge about the First Amendment among many college students, it's really a failure of, of people in my position, of educators, uh, and not really a failure of, of the students. And so I think we can do, we can do a better job of that, um, subject to obviously, obviously limitations on curriculum and things like that. But, but I, when I was in high school, I had almost no substantive instruction. I mean, I learned about the Bill of Rights and the text of the First Amendment, but it was, we never looked into what the scope really was and what that meant. And I think that is something that many other people uh, have, might have similar experiences in their uh, early education. I would love to make American government and con law two required courses for every Rutgers student, but it would not serve any purpose. We've been complaining about civics since the 1970s, 1980s. We've been worrying about the declining voting. We've been worrying about the loss of what it means to be America. But the data that I mentioned earlier from the 60s, when we were still teaching civics in some meaningful way, shows that the public really didn't get it back then either. Um, your freedom of speech depends on who you are with at the time you are speaking. The government's control of your speech depends on the politicians, the elites, the bureaucrats, who I hope have learned what the actual law says. So the fact that you don't know all of the ramifications of it really doesn't matter to me particularly. I'd much rather you learn to be civil to each other uh, than to learn exactly when you can be aggressive and when you have to hold back, when you can publish um, what sounds a lot like uh, slander or something, and when you can't, when you have the right. Some of us are incredibly, um, what's the right word, obnoxious, incredibly mean and vicious to push the boundaries as far as we possibly can. You know some of those people, I'm sure. Some of our faculty might be some of those people, I imagine. And you have people who are much too quick, in your opinion, to take offense. I'm sure some of your Facebook and Twitter friends are in that category. I know some of mine are. Um, but I don't see a way of teaching ourselves really how to do better, except let's be civil. Let's be aware of each other. That, that's the best I can do. Um, yeah, I think that that's definitely a great place to start. And also, I'm sure that having more civics classes and con law won't hurt, at least. Um, It'll help my, my enrollment numbers. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
I think another, like, for me at least, having gone through, because in high school, like, I didn't learn any of this. Like, I just took U.S. history the way that everyone else does, which doesn't have very much um, con law or civil liberties or anything in it. Um, when I got here and started studying political science, I think the biggest takeaway for me was just how nuanced the law is and how many different uh, perspectives and and sort of implications there are to everything. Because I think everyone, especially people our age, like students nowadays, it's really easy to just like have sort of a quick line about free speech and how much of it you have and where you have it. But like in reality, free speech and all the other civil rights and civil liberties we have are a lot more nuanced than that. And they have a very rich history behind them, which influences how we use it today and how we interpret it today. Mm. So I think first getting people to understand that the right to free speech is not just what's written in the First Amendment. And it might, it's a lot more than that. And I think that hopefully will spark enough curiosity for people to go out and either experience it on their own or, you know, learn more about it and understand it a little bit better. Yeah, I think um, we've uh, drawn uh, distinctions here between, uh, you know, civics, knowledge of, of civics in the legal sense and, uh, and participation in or awareness of civics in more of a, a generalized social sense. And so I think if, we're, if the question is uh, talking about where do we go from here, um, what actions do we actually take to improve our uh, civil discourse, I think that one of the things for us to consider um, is that uh, as students who have some measure of, of interest in civil discourse and in, in civics more broadly, um, you know, we should be the ones who are talking to our peers about this issue. Um, cause if you think about uh, really any issue that is divisive or sensitive um, or that is a consistent ongoing problem uh, in society, um, when, when you're uh, confronted by or in a discussion with someone who is like you, you know, someone who you consider to be one of your peers, you're more likely to listen to them than you would say a, a professor. Uh, no, no offense to you, of course, but um, that's just the, I thought, I thought the nature you were, I thought they were listening to me. <laughs> <laughs> we can always dream. <laughs> but I think that, um, that there's a, a real opportunity um, here as met with a, a number of other um, issues in the, the social uh, dialogue now um, for, for us, you know, as the ones who, who are, are proponent, proponents of knowledge on this, this issue, um, to actually uh, turn that into action on our, on our own parts and, uh, and talk to our peers. Well, one of the important things about this lecture series is to give everybody the ability to respond or should I call it the response ability to others. <laughs> and uh, it really is now your turn out there to uh, ask questions, to challenge, and to uh, create the kind of dialogue we think is so, such a signature of Rutgers. So I'm relying on you. Any questions? Yes, sir. Uh, so going back to the microaggressions, uh, one of the problems I have with microaggressions is that unlike hate speech and discrimination, it's not always cut and dry. A lot of it has to do with like personal experience. An um, example I like to give is, let's say I say that I think all illegals should be deported. Someone whose parents maybe came here legally would take offense to that. But their parents may have not done it out of anything bad, that they just want to give the child a better life. They want to help them out. They came to this country. They contributed. I've done nothing wrong. They take offense to that. But my parents came here uh, legally, so I might think, why are there benefits from coming to the country illegally when my parents did it the legal way and they get no more extra benefits? So my, uh, I take offense to illegal immigrants, not because I'm like a racist or anything, just my parents did it the right way and something like that. So who's right in that situation? So I take offense to them, they take offense to what I said, who's right? The, the political debate is perfectly appropriate. Should benefits be extended to those who are here from undocumented sources? The problem with what you said is the term illegals as a noun. These are, in, these are people who happen to have come here illegally in, in some way. And that's where the microaggression sneaks in. The debate's perfectly appropriate. Does that make sense? Do you want to ex expand that? No. <laughs> no, um, I mean, 
you know, one could get into a very long argument about what it means to say my parents came here legally. In fact, I had such an argument on Facebook about three weeks ago and the individual produced his parents' citizenship papers, which they got after they arrived. One of them came as a displaced person, refugee from Europe, and was allowed in under some who knows what program. I'm not sure, because he didn't produce that document. Um, and now he says the same thing that, that, that you just said, that, that these, these, these people did not come here legally. And I asked him if he knew what the word WOP meant, and he never did respond to that. But do you know what WOP means, WAP? WAP is a derogatory term uh, targeting who, Jake? Targeting Italians. Why? What does the word actually stand for? It stands for without papers. And what does without papers imply? That they came here without papers, which means they came here illegally, but were allowed to stay once they arrived at Ellis Island. In other words, we had a very different system for letting people in back at that time. The system has changed. The fact that your parents and my parents came here under a different system, is that really relevant? And so the question really is, what do we do today? It's not, my parents are legal. Yours shouldn't, you shouldn't be here because yours aren't. So it, it's, that's the nature of, of the argument. And when you bring in the language that we're happy to use, that's when we get distracted by, by the language distorting the human contact. That's great. I, I, I actually wanted you to talk about, you said something very perspicacious, which is when we use the word illegal as a noun versus an adjective, right? So if you say you committed an illegal act, versus calling somebody an illegal, which is a criminal, right? So it is that, conf uh, that carelessness of the language that mm -hmm. oftentimes becomes a microaggression. So in fact, you can, as you say, talk about illegal acts and how do we remedy these illegal acts. However, when you just make that act the definition of the person, him or herself, and they say, you are an illegal, you are basically um, uh, causing that microaggression. And I go back to an incident that happened about 10 years ago where I spoke to a group of, um, uh, it was actually more than 10 years ago, and it was the first time I encountered the term uh, illegal. Um, when a student, uh, I, I was speaking with a group of high school students, and um, a young woman who really was very dedicated and wanted to go to, to college uh, said to me, um, I've always given these kind of rah-rah speeches about, you know, work hard and you'll get to college. And, 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 and I always got questions about financial aid and I got questions about, you know, how do I study better? And all of a sudden, this is the first time uh, I, I was addressed by a, 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 a student saying to me, um, I'm illegal, how do I get to college? And she had internalized the language mm -hmm. of, uh, you know, she's a DACA student, clearly. Uh, she came at a, at, at a time not by any choice of her own, but she had, uh, and I had to stop the conversation and first of all, talk about the fact that she could not think of herself as an illegal. And that was, she, she had internalized that language. And second of all, I had to tell everybody else there present that, uh, the, the, that the fear that this student lived in, because she, she, she mentioned that she, every time she went home, she was afraid if her parents were or were not going to be there. Uh, and, 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 and it raised a whole set of issues. But, uh, but I, it, that it, moment stuck with me because uh, I had to imagine what does it feel like thinking that you are a criminal all, every day of your life? How do you go through the world or through the everyday thinking of yourself in those terms? And, 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 and what is my responsibility as a teacher to make sure that she does not think of herself as being crim a criminalized body? And you can expand that very easily. I have a family member who has suffers from mental illness. Um, when this happened, um, the minister of the church where she was attending began to add prayers for the mentally ill. And after a while, we said, can you change the language, please, to people with mental illness? Because 
being mentally ill is not the totality of what one is when one has mental illness. Being this description, unemployed, undocumented, illegal, mentally ill, whatever, is not all of what one is. And let's remind ourselves of the humanity. And when we lump it down to that one description, it defines more than we intend. I would, I would just add that I, I uh, think it's very important not to, I, I think it's important to have these discussions even if, uh, for example, if someone does believe, and just for the record, I do not believe that people who are here and who are undocumented should be all of them deported. I strongly disbelieve with that position, but I would actually welcome the opportunity to try to explain to someone who did have that position why, in my view, uh, I would argue that they should at least consider an alternative position. So I wouldn't want them to be afraid of expressing that. Um, because if they don't express it, then, then I don't get the chance to explain why, in my view, it's a position I very strongly disagree with. And so I would not want fear of articulating those opinions to prevent uh, what could be an opportunity to provide an alternative point of view that could give someone a different perspective. Thank you. Yes, sir. So uh, just to continue the question about microaggressions, I think the way you all are discussing it reminds me that it feels like a sort of progress to start thinking about the language of a number of different issues that we may not have thought of before. So if calling someone illegal, for example, so we are recognizing people's humanity in language. So I think, personally, I, I treat that as progress. I see that as progress in how we think about the issues we discuss. But I want to ask about its political effectiveness. So I think it is important, in a sense, to think about the language we use. But do you think that there is a right way in terms of getting people who are, let's say, from a more conservative position on an issue to think about people's humanity rather than um, how we discuss it. So, for example, if I, in this conversation, if we were to, if someone were to say um, that these people are, um, let's just say, people say that the mental illness retarded a lot, right? So, and I say to them that I don't believe in that language, I think you're kind of diminishing the humanity of a person who is suffering with some sort of mental illness. I think that might be, an, what do you think is an effective way to bring the language into the question without having a response from a more conservative person that you're being a snowflake or you are sidetracking the conversation um, and still maintaining the importance of the political conversation behind what you're discussing? Um, well, okay, I think that this is something that I at least have encountered a bit in my classes, but I think also is just an issue among, like, people are, like, I've noticed it among people our age and students and things like that. Um, and I think it's, it's important to, in all of these situations, I think just stay civil and remember that there is oftentimes a separation, whether intentional or not between the content at hand and the way that we package the content or the way that we deal with the content and the way that we communicate it. And so um, I would hope that whoever you're talking with is open-minded enough and also sort of aware enough of the situation to also see that and to know that there is significance in language that can be independent from significance in content. So like what we were talking about before, the difference between saying that someone is mentally ill versus suffering from a mental illness, or someone is here illegally or entered the country illegally versus someone who isn't illegal, that difference in language is something that transcends the content of what you're talking about. It applies to how we talk about people generally. And that's like a different discussion and can be applied to multiple different political topics. So I think that just sort of airing that out and getting that into the clear and hopefully having a conversation with someone who's understanding enough about it is something that's important. And also maybe maybe to a certain extent even bracketing the political content-based conversation to first have this conversation about language. Like what are we really talking about here? Like who is the people, like what is the demographic that we're talking about? What is the concept that we're trying to deal with? And I think that that might be useful in establishing some clarity. So I think that um, uh, one of the un unfortunate things about uh, a lot of these conversations is that uh, to do them well always takes more time than any of us ever have to give them. Um, but assuming assuming that you have an infinite amount of time to, to offer you know a conversation with uh, with this uh, hypothetical person, um, I think one of the strategies that I have found some amount of, of success with because I often do find myself in rooms with people that uh, I 
don't agree with or, or that uh, take issue with me in some way. And one of the strategies that I found effective with this is uh, when they say a word or a phrase or, or express an idea um, that you find problematic, asking them, well, what do you mean when you use this word? What does that word mean to you? Because our understanding of language is based off of our lived experiences. Um, and so they may not mean what it is that, that you think that they mean. Um, and so uh, ironing out the differences uh, in a sense of, of what message they're sending versus what message you're receiving um, can help to create that, that civil dialogue. And uh, a lot of times the issue, assuming that they're not um, intentionally trying to, to rile you up, if we're assuming you know, good intent here, um, then oftentimes the, the reason why things uh, get heated or why people uh, label each other as, as being um, overly harsh or overly sensitive or you know a snowflake is um, because the recognition of, of those different lived experiences is just not part of the conversation. Yes, sir. Did people hear the question? I don't know. If you said the question was, I think I, what I heard was, the fear, can the fear of being offensive limit political discourse? Is that what you said, Brian? You know, we had that in class just a, a few weeks ago when we were discussing um, Christian, no, we, when we were discussing scripture. If you might remember, some of you were talking about one of the stories in the Hebrew scripture, the Old Testament. Um, I won't go into details, but uh, the, the, the scripture had multiple meanings depending on what part of it you wanted to focus on. And I asked the students what they thought it actually meant. And there was dead silence in the room. Because the obvious answer to that question was it's an anti-homosexual passage. And what the students said to me afterwards is that everybody was kind of embarrassed to say that, but many of them were thinking that at the time. So yes, certainly, certainly, there's one example right there, which you have seen yourself, Brian, where yes, the fear of being offensive can limit the chance to actually get something out that needs to be gotten out, needs to be discussed. Um, yeah. Yes, there was a young woman up there. Yes. You have to speak up louder. We talked about lack of being picture in America and the American political system and So the question was, what is the source of the lack of tolerance? Yeah. And, do you think and, and is it new? So I, I um, think that in, you know, most of the issues that, that we're discussing here are, are not uh, brand new in terms of their overall existence. But I think that there, of course, are newer factors that are influencing um, the issues. And so the, when discussing a you know, lack of tolerance, um, I'll bring it back again to, to technology and, and, uh, and media, you know, communication systems. Um, one of the big issues that we're facing, you know, today um, that is definitely newer, um, a, a newer issue than, than the overall issue of lack of tolerance in general, is um, that because uh, communication is so easy and, uh, and that media is so decentralized, um, we have the option of, of gravitating towards uh, what we like rather than necessarily what the world is. Um, and you know, that can lead to, to a lack of tolerance just by virtue of you know, if, you, if you are entering an echo chamber and you sit in there for most of your life when you um, enter a space where, uh, where other people are coming out and they're f coming out of a different echo chamber, well then both of you are going to view the other one as intolerant of whatever it is that you were hearing before you uh, came into that space. Um, and so I think that uh, the overall issue of intolerance is not a new one by any stretch, um, but, uh, but the newer uh, phenomena with uh, emerging technologies and, and changing in the media landscape is definitely aggravating it. John, did you want to add something to that? I'm, I, I don't have much, to, I, other than intolerance has a, a very long history, um, not only of course in this country, but in, in human history. So. Uh, the forms in which it manifests obviously are different and the particular challenges we have, but um, it's, it's, um, it's a, a feature of, of, our, of our civilization for as long as it's existed. I think in some ways it is new right now, and that 
Well, though, let me preface that by saying that in 1859, 1860, a member of the US Congress cracked the skull of another member of the US Congress on the floor of the US House. So certainly intolerance is not brand new to this country. Um, however, we are, I think, in a period of very deep social change right now. We went from thinking that same-sex marriage was ridiculous in 1996, 1995, mm -hmm. to legalizing it in 2015. And in fact, when, Chicago, when San Francisco first legalized, began performing same-sex marriages in 2003, I th threw out a paper assignment from my American government class and said, OK, tell me how many years it'll take before it's legal nationwide. Five years, more or less. And the students, you know, most of them said, this is going to take a long time. But from 2003 to 2015, it's half of your lifetime, maybe, but it's 12 years. Yeah. Um, and there are more changes, but that's just one example of the wrenching change that we are through. And that creates lots of space for conflict as we move faster, move slower, resist, push, that kind of thing. I always said one thing, that it's a tried and true political technique to, to utilize intolerance and to build on it, to, to build power. And, and um, I think you probably see more of that you know, globally in, in the recent years than probably we had in, in the several years before that. So there's an ebb and flow correlated to how politicians and those in power might try to exploit intolerance or to stir up, stir up intolerance. And I think that hasn't been constant. I think it's frankly worse now than it was two or three years ago. Yes, sir, with the plaid shirt. Uh, yes, sir, to the professor in the middle of the table. Uh, serious microaggression against me uh, based on your own standards and values because you use the term Old Testament. And as a Jew, we don't recognize the New Testament. We recognize the Hebrew Scriptures. And if you buy that, and if you accept my comment, then it'll just show how utterly stultifying this whole political correctness movement has, has gone to because it's absurd. Okay, I'm old enough. I was born in the middle 40s. I remember when there was bias and prejudice against people in the United States, particularly uh, blacks, Puerto Ricans, Mexicans, American Indians. There was real bias against It was physical. It was bad. It was unbelievable. The young people, they have no idea how they dehumanize it. It wasn't just bias. It was mm -hmm. dehumanize it. And fortunately, that changed. But today, I see young people getting offended at things that are absolutely trifles. And what worries me is, again, as it's been pointed out here, it's stultifying to thought briefing. It's stultifying to intellectual thought and conversation because you have to think every second, oh my goodness, is anybody going to get offended? Secondly, people are not learning how to defend themselves verbally. I've been insulted many times, I can tell you, uh, for many different reasons. And I had to learn how to defend myself, both verbally and sometimes physically. Okay, not a good idea to do it physically, but sometimes you have to. Mm -hmm. I was in the army overseas. Uh, there was no one worrying about the, whether my feelings were hurt. Okay, and 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 thirdly, uh, what was I going to say? Uh, I had a third statement in mind, but uh, I, I think. What I said is, is perhaps uh, enough, that uh, we have to learn how to respond. And we can't, well, the third thing that I do want to bring out is perhaps rather than get offended at every little thing that does make us uneasy, maybe we need a little bit of Buddhist ego reduction and recognize that, hey, we're not the center of the universe. Mm -hmm. And if we just get our ego out of the picture, and recognize that we have no core self that has to be defended 24-7, maybe our lives will be a little bit easier in general. Certainly it takes two to uh, have conversations. If I said Old Testament, and I think I did, I thought he also said Christian, uh, Hebrew scripture, and if I didn't, I do apologize. I did say Christian scripture. No, 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 I, I, I realize that. No, 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 I, l l let me finish. Um, Something my class hears me say regularly is, is Christian scripture, Hebrew, Hebrew scripture. Something very similar happened several years ago when I was teaching. Somebody asked me to, 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 to explain the Arab-Israeli conflict, and I used the term occupied territories. No, and sorry, I used the term six-day war, and a student told me that was offensive to, uh, to Arabs because it made the, the war sound 
like it was a foregone conclusion. We, we call it the 1967 war, thank you very much. And I said, I didn't realize that, thank you for telling me. Uh, I did use the term occupied territories, which is balancing the, uh, the offense. Um, so you know, that, 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 there is that kind of activity going on. Some of it is nonsense, some of it is very, very hurtful. Yes. I could make a comment. Well, it might seem ridiculous, but I you pointed out like I got offended at that, so you can't say it. And it seems like it's kind of productive that way. I think to be able to have social change is to be able to look at things in a nuanced way and we have things so far from the poor in the US. And if nobody ever stood up for themselves and was like, hey, listen, this is wrong, then the changes would have never happened. And at that time if somebody was like I'm sure so many people are like, no, you're being sensitive, get over it. So it's kind of like the same topic where if you really want social change, you have to stop comparing life with the past and say, hey, look, it's so much better now. I mean, some things you're right, it is, it is ridiculous if people can't have conversation, but then that's where education has to come in, where you have to learn what other types of people living in your country have gone through and to be educated about how you discuss civil conversations. What does it mean to be mindful of where everybody else is coming from? And sometimes you might make a mistake, and that's human, and that's okay. And if people are in a place where they're educated and learn where everyone's coming from, then people wouldn't be so offended. Because then they would know, hey, this person's trying to talk to me, and they're trying to understand from my perspective, because they've had an education on it. And it's not just someone that doesn't know where I'm coming from trying to impose what they think I know. The professor wants us to be grammarians and make the distinction between nouns and adjectives. If I say the beautiful woman, that's okay. I'm using beautiful as an adjective. But if I say the beauty, oh, that's a noun. I'm, I'm categorizing her. Is that not observed? Okay, there's uh, lots of hands. So uh, we go back there, and then we'll come down here. That's a good question. Yeah, well, we, do, we don't know the answer yet. Yeah, and, and so it, it's a really, it's an incredibly important question. You know, companies like Facebook, and they, they are private companies, so they certainly have the right uh, to ban, for example, uh, threatening speech. Um, also, uh, there are, I don't know the specifics, but there are substantial protections. I mean, it, it would, it's as a practical matter, if someone makes a threat on Facebook today, you know, of the billion people on Facebook or whatever, whatever the number is, I, I don't know that, I'm sorry, you had to. It kind of reminds me a little bit about like the position, uh, I'm trying to, like, the position of like, the position position's confidentiality. Like, or not that, I mean, it's like a psychiatrist uh, hears somebody say that they're going to do something, or like, uh, like there's like that ethical boundary, like do they say something because of, do they not say something because they've been bound by confidentiality, or do they have to say something because it's a clear threat? I think it works the same way with a private company and somebody making a statement on a private, private server, but it's being operated on public. The parallel might be there, but I'm not sure it's been litigated or, or legislated yet completely. Okay, so we, we have, sorry, we're running out of time. So let, let's get to this question right here and next. Yes, sir. Hi. Hi. <laughs> so I wanted to talk about the sort of irony in the fact that we keep talking about the one side, we might call it the more progressive side, being offended, but then there's this sort of ironic gender right side becomes offended by the desire to move in a certain direction, and that seems to be 
lead to more of a clash than anything with the fact that every, now everybody's offended, but you can't so much. All I'm offended because they're responding to somebody else's offense, and it's getting tangled up in my own speech and showing how complicated that can be. So how does one overcome? Well, how does one deal with the fact that another side's getting offended for the another side being offended? Do you want to <laughs> So I think um, uh, this sort of plays into to something that I, I mentioned earlier in, in terms of, uh, you know, assuming that you have an, a limitless amount of time to, to engage in civil dialogue. Um, you know, if, if someone says something that is offensive to you and you say that uh, to that person, you are offensive or offended me, then they become offended that you find them offensive. And that uh, creates a... a very bizarre situation, as as you're as you're describing. Um, it's I certainly will say it's it's very difficult to handle that appropriately in a, a group setting or more of a public setting. You know, if we're just talking uh, in sort of a, a generalized you know left versus right type of a dialogue, and that's that's difficult and and almost uh, impossible to actually address. Um, uh, but you know, if we are dealing you know person to person, human to human. Um, then it becomes a, a much more uh, simple, um, not a fix exactly, but a much more simple dialogue to have because you are one person, you have a certain set of lived experiences that dictate how you view language and what you find offensive or not, mm -hmm. and they also have that as their individual person. Um, and so, uh, you know, certainly I've, I've uh, encountered situations where in a group setting someone is offended or offended by someone else's offense, you know, and, and that becomes very messy. But if you take those people who are involved and take them out of that public space, then they become less uh, symbolic of, of their positions, you know, less of a, a part of the, the opposite side and more human. And uh, that becomes a, a much more um, easier discussion to have. I'll decide that in my own engagements, I, I maybe I fail at this, but I try to be as tolerant as I can to people who might say things that offend me. In other words, not, I mean, in, 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 in engagements, sometimes I'm going to get offended. And, and if someone's intentionally trying to offend me, that's kind of more offensive than if they inadvertently do it. Um, but if someone inadvertently offends me, you know, it, it doesn't usually ruin my day. <laughs> Like when my grandmother used to say things that I just would make me cringe, you know. <laughs> but, but you're right, uh, uh, going back to the question of nuance, right? Uh, there's something about having the, the intimate uh, discussion with a friend in a small setting where nuance is something that you can entertain versus the soundbite. And obviously in, the, in a larger public arena, the soundbite becomes much more modular and easier to, to transport and share with people. And that oftentimes, uh, uh, becomes two different registers of communication that we are always attentive to. And in the university, it's one that we're very attentive to because that be is precisely what we're always doing. And I, it's a great perspective. And I would just add one additional complicating factor that goes well beyond the universities. I think technology complicates this enormously right. because you just get words and you don't get the tone of voice, you don't get the volume, you don't get the intonation, and that can lead to all sorts of complexities, unsurprisingly, and we see a lot of that. So don't read the comments on any published news story because they get nasty very, very fast. But you might remember the story about a month ago on Twitter that some guy who I believe was a veteran, but I don't remember the story completely, called an actress by a very derogatory name, a, a one-word name. He just blasted her with this one-word thing. And you may have seen the story. And she spent some time researching who this guy was, discovered something of his story, and then responded. And discovered he had back problems. She found him a back surgeon who would work for free. I don't know if you've heard that story, but this was all over the internet about a month ago, where even with technology, if we listen and look past the offense, if we don't choose to be offended and react with the offense, we can still find connections. In other words, don't use all caps. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we have time for one more question. Um, <clears throat> Close enough. And I'm not offended. <laughs> I'm offended by that. <laughs>
first exposure to um, a controversial public speaker was when Milo Yiannopoulos decided to come here on his tour. Uh, and that was a huge controversy, although now he's kind of faded out of existence. Um, now, my problem with him is that he doesn't present no, evidence or facts to justify his opinions. In fact, he tried to publish a book, and it didn't get published because so much of it was spent trolling and just saying offensive things for the sake of being offensive. Um, which is why I was very much supportive, that, like in hindsight, I'm very much supportive that like we didn't have it. Um, because I don't think that kind of discussion is, is should be allowed on a college campus that supports intellectual discussion rather than just screaming obscenity. So my question is, should a troll like Milo Yiannopoulos or Richard Spencer be allowed on college campuses, and why do you think this kind of um, free speech should be allowed? If you say. Oh, well, okay. I'm not going to defend uh, the viewpoints of, of either of those two people. I think part of the answer ties very closely to the type of institution. So a private institution has every right to decline to allow anybody uh, they want, including th those two individuals. Um, University of Florida had to, as far as I understand it, allow Richard Spencer to speak because they have a venue which, as I understood it, they rent to space to anybody. Uh, and as a public university, they were then prevented um, from using what was called viewpoint dis discrimination to uh, preventing uh, Richard Spencer from, from speaking there. So I think the allowed question ties very closely to the, to the context. And, and if, if a public university is offering a space to any member of the community um, to rent it, then they do run into First Amendment issues if they tr try to prevent that. Um, but, but that's very different in a private setting. And again, I should underscore again that in no way do I endorse any of, of the offensive statements that are attributed to, to those two people. I, I find, of course, that's... Let me toss two names out uh, in response also. One of them is Snooki. Uh, she came here some years ago to give a speech, did she not? Yeah. Uh, at the invitation of some students and the administration faculty thought that was a total waste of money. We got made fun of across the country, I think, because of that invitation. But we paid her $30,000 out of your money because our student government decided she would be a, an interesting speaker. She came and she spoke, and yes, it was kind of stupid, but she, <laughs> it still happened. Last fall, we had another speaker, very different, but also somewhat unpalatable. His name was James O'Keefe, uh, a Rutgers graduate, founder of the organization Project Veritas, Project Veritas, uh, and he uh, destroyed a, uh, a group called Acorn some years ago by, by altering the contents of, a, of an interview, manipulating the information, make it look like something was happening that had not been happening, and uh, they destroyed the organization. And he came here last November, last October, at the invitation of one of our student groups to talk about real media and how we need to take on the liberal media. Lots of people, including myself, I will admit, were opposed to the idea, but in my capacity as supporting my students, I did advertise the event. We do have that obligation. Let, let me just say that I was recently at a conference in DC with other university administrators, and the issue of, of controversial speakers came up, and Richard Spencer um, and a, a colleague from Auburn said that he had been invited by the students, but then it turned out that it wasn't so much that the students reached out to him, but he reaches out to student groups and offers to come and speak mm -hmm. for free. So the, the, this is a very particular political strategy. It's not that students themselves are aware, oh, I want to have a Milos or, or Milos, right? <laughs> no S, I think. Milo. Milo. Uh, yeah. Milo. A uh, Milo. Or, or, or Richard Spencer come, but rather they're aggressively looking. So um, he, he got the students to pay $20,000, which is what his fee was at the time. And uh, because recently there's been such a, a controversy, uh, what's happening at Berkeley especially, and we have to look carefully at the Berkeley case because I think what happens at Berkeley will uh, have implications to all of us. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things that that the university did is that they got the 
police to figure out how much it's going to cost uh, to monitor the situation, and it was going to cost the university half a million dollars for his visit. So the president says, you know what, here's the $20,000, don't come. And he obviously was very, very upset, but because the cost of, of bringing in a speaker for half a million dollars was far more uh, expensive, but also the, the, the publicity that they were getting that was just so negative. So it was a, it, it was a very, very interesting uh, debate as to do you bring somebody and pay them this, uh, uh, $20,000 becomes nothing compared to half a million dollars that the university then has to flip the bill. So uh, lately, uh, these issues about bringing in controversial speakers is something that many universities are really debating because there is the need to have the free speech and the open space. However, uh, the half a million dollars could pay for and for the record, I'm not getting paid anything by Rutgers to be here, and I used frequent flyer miles to fly here yesterday. <laughs> But anyway, but I really appreciate uh, all of you for your wonderful questions. Uh, as I said, the ability to respond. You have been very responsible. And, uh, and, 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 and that's, I think, what makes Rutgers such a wonderful place because our students are always here. I hope you saw that, John. And uh, we are very happy that you are here and you joined us to uh, create this conversation, this ongoing conversation. I thank Professor Fielding for his uh, participation in his class and our two wonderful students here, uh, uh, Elise and, oh my God. April. April, I'm sorry, April. I, I got so stuck with Nikolaus. It's, it's okay. her, <laughs> she made me sure I got her last name right, so I forgot your first name. But anyway, it's also old age. But anyway, I really appreciate you all for a wonderful, wonderful discussion, and I'm sure we can continue it. We have some snacks on the side. We invite the students, and I'm sure some of our speakers will be happy to uh, discuss with you on one-on-one. -on -one. Thank you so much. Thanks to all of you.